for today. Because if you even want to know what you care about, you just got to, got to look and see what you pray about. I love that quote that says, if all your prayers are answered, would it change the world or just your world? Because so often we come to God with a little shopping list of everything we want in life, but I want to ask you, what do you pray for? What breaks your heart? Because if we're going to talk about half of the house, it, it really starts with us looking at our hearts as individuals and asking the question, what does your heart break for? We're in the middle of 21 days of prayer and fasting. Now fasting just means going without something. It means abstaining from something. Some people are fasting Netflix, some people are fasting social media, some people are fasting alcohol, some people are fasting me. Why? Because you're going without something, having less of something, so you can experience more of God, so you can become more God conscious. It's James 4 verses 8, it says, as you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. Why are we praying and fasting? Because as we go into heart for the house, we don't want any of this to be done in our own strength. It has to be done in his strength. We do our natural so he can do the natural. We do our ordinary so he can do that extraordinary. If we didn't pray and fast, this would just be a building fund trying to produce a new building in our own strength. Now we're believing that next Sunday something monumentous is going to take place. Something so significant that's going to have a ripple effect across this nation and across Europe. This is why we're gathering together. And this is why we're praying. Because there's power in prayer. Charles Burge, we're the first mega church in London. Church of over 10,000 people. A renowned speaker. He said, I would rather teach one person to pray than 10 people to preach. Corrie Ten Boom, a female preacher, she asked the question, is prayer your steering wheel or just your spare tire? Ouch. Another guy, John Bunyan from America, he says, when you pray, rather let your heart be without words and your words be without heart. What he's establishing is this, is that when you pray, it's not about how well you can articulate the words, it's about the heart. So I want to ask today, when you pray, where is your heart? In 2019, which is this year in July, I went to Hillsong Conference. Was anyone else at Hillsong Conference? Give me a wave. Yeah. It was an incredible time where our church gathered together in one room in the O2 Arena. But one night is very significant to me. A guy called Bill Johnson from Bethel was speaking, and he challenged us when he came to prayer. He says, when you pray, do you pray because you need God to do something for you, or do you pray because of who he is and what he's already done for you? It hit me hard because the Sundays when I'm preaching, my prayer life goes to a whole new level. The energy, the passion, the tenacity. Because I never ever want to get up here in front of you guys and share just my own thoughts, share just my own wisdom, share just a few keys that I've prepared. No, I always wanted to only ever be his word and his word alone. So the weeks when I'm preaching, I'm desperate. And the weeks when I'm not preaching, it's not like I'm dealing drugs or anything, like I'm still reading my Bible and I'm still praying. But my passion level drops, my tenacity level drops. Why? Because I don't need God to do something for me. The moment Bill Johnson said it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I made a decision then, never again would I just go through the motions. Never again would I pray because I need God to do something for me. But I will always pray with the same amount of passion because of who he is and what he has already done for me. I made a decision that I will not let my situation or my circumstance dictate my prayer life. But I will allow my prayer life to dictate into my situation my circumstance. Can you imagine if at the end of the service we just decided to pray for Birmingham as a city? Pray for this nation and we pray with the same passion for others as we pray for ourselves. Don't you think that might start to change things? Because prayer is not about getting God to do our will, it's about us aligning with His will. See, prayer changes things, but what you've got to understand is that prayer changes us and that's how it changes things. And I believe today, as we start to pray, God will start to give you new ideas, He'll start to give you new dreams, God will start to break your heart for things that maybe your heart never broken for before. I believe today the key all starts with prayer. Where is your heart? Nehemiah is overwhelmed by the situation, but through prayer, he starts to get a little bit of courage to see how he can actually overcome the situation. Chapter 2, this is what happens. Early the following spring, in the month of Nisan, that was a month when you could get a good deal on a Japanese car. <laughs> I'm a dad, I've got an 18 month old boy, it is my job and responsibility to bring the dad jokes. If dad jokes die out, it is a sad day for all of us. Tell you what we're going to do just to encourage all the dads. I'm going to say that joke again. And I want everyone from the front to the back to laugh out loud, okay? <laughs> just to encourage every single dad. In the month of Nissan, the month when you can get a good deal on a Japanese car. <laughs> there we go. That was for all you dads. I know there's a few dads in the house and you've been sitting on those sad jokes. You've lost the courage to share them because your kids are now teenagers. And there's going to be an awkward silence, yeah? Now is your day. This Sunday when you have lunch, you share those dad jokes. And bask in the awkwardness. That's all part of it. 
In the month of Nisan, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was serving the king his wife. I never before appeared sad in his presence. So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified. But I replied, long live the king. How could I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried are in ruins, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. The king asked, well, how can I help you? Statement number two. If it is God's will, he will make it happen. False. If it is God's will, he will use us to make it happen. Nehemiah doesn't just pray about the situation and leave it like that. No, he actually does something about the situation. He goes to see the king. And what is he? Terrified. He's afraid. And why? Because to speak to the king is literally to put your life on the line. Nehemiah gets out of his comfort zone. He carries a burden. In fact, the name Nehemiah means comforted by God. But all the way through the scripture, the time when you see that he was comforted by God was when he stepped out of the comfort zone. I want to encourage you when it comes to Heart for the House, it means that we all actually have to carry the burden together. We actually have to step out of our comfort zone. We're not just praying about it, we're actually doing something about it. See, it's called Heart for the House, not Heart for the Hotel. There's a big difference between a house and a hotel. Once a year, I take my wife to a hotel, maybe the Premier Inn if she's lucky. <laughs> and when they're, we're there, what I've realized is that my wife is very, very different in a hotel. Like, I'll drop towels on the floor, she doesn't care. I will make the bed, she doesn't care. I will even occasionally drop some food on the floor in the hotel, she finds it funny. But in my house, in my own house, if I was to do the same, in fact, if I was just to drop the smallest morsel, breadcrumb, or piece of food on the floor, my whole house is on lockdown. My wife has got a big, you know, gorgeous rubber gloves on. She's scrubbing the floor, looking me in the eyes, and just saying, if you ever, ever, ever do that again, I will kill you. <laughs> My wife has a love language, and her love language is cleanliness. That's right. Four years ago, it was Valentine's Day, and she said, Dad, for Valentine's Day, I want you to get me this brand new mop. It's an H2O X. She showed me it on the internet. It was like a mop meets a transformer. It was a whole big gadget thing. I said, if that's what you want, that's what I'll give you. I got it online. I gave it to her Valentine's Day. She loved it so much that she hugged it. Really weird. Really weird. She even asked me to take a photo of her hugging them up. Again, really weird, really weird. And I took a picture of it and I gave her the photo. She got that and she put it on Instagram. Not just on a story which lasted 24 hours, but on her grid which lasts for as long as you want it to last. And then she put, what an amazing Valentine's Day. Best hubby ever. He bought me the H-O-X X mop. Love him. Problem is that uh, not everyone knows the backstory. <laughs> not everyone knows that I love languages and cleanliness and that she asked me to get the pop mop. I just look like that husband that has given a mop to my wife. <laughs> but I tell you, I tell you the story because the cleanliness in my house is very different to the cleanliness in the hotel. Why? Because in the hotel, she's just renting it. In the hotel, she's just borrowing it. But in the house, there's ownership. In the house, there's responsibility there. In the house, she carries the burden. I want to ask today, how do you see this house? Do you see it as a house or do you see it as a hotel? Now, if you're visiting, if you're here just for the first couple of weeks and you're checking us out, at the same time we're also checking you out, you can see this as a hotel room. And that's alright, because we want you to come and experience a room. We want you to experience what it means to be in community, <laughs> experience the family dynamic. But if you know this is your house, if you said Hillsong, Hillsong Church is my home, then my question is, are you still treated like a hotel? We just spectate from the outside in, we just come and you just go, just go shoot. Because the idea is that in a family, we all pitch it together and we carry the burden together. This church was never built on success after success. It was always built on sacrifice after sacrifice. Hillsong Church is not built on the gifts and skill of few, but on the sacrifice of many. So if we're talking about half of the house, and you said to me, right, Dan, if I am going to carry the burden, if I'm going to contribute to half of the house, surely that means financially I will have less if I give away. But this is the beautiful thing about the world. It is so different to the world. See, you surrender in the world, yes, you lose everything. You surrender to God in the word and you gain everything. You see, you build his house and he will also build your house. I want to show you this in the scripture. In chapter 2, verses 8, Nehemiah is speaking to the king and he says, And please give me a letter addressed to Asaph, the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give me timber. I will need it to make beams for the gates of the temple fortress, for the city walls, and for a house for myself. And the king granted this request because the gracious hand of God was on me. I love the way Nehemiah approached the king. He didn't say, hey king, 
one day I'm going to rebuild the walls. Like it's on my bucket list. But right now I want to get my own house sorted. So will you give me everything I need to build my own house? I want to have a balcony, swimming pool, plasma, Xbox, FIFA 20. Give me everything I need first so I can build my own empire. Then when I'm sorted, then when I'm comfortable, then send the provision, I'll get on and rebuild the wall. It's not what Nehemiah does, is he? And he's like, I'm on a mission. I'm going to rebuild this wall. So I've got this vision, will you give me the provision? And while I'm rebuilding the walls, in the same way that you provided for me to rebuild Brent, while you provide for me to rebuild the walls, will you also provide for me so I can build my house? I believe in the same way Nehemiah approached the king is how we are all meant to approach the king of kings. And we say, God, I'm living a God first life. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm about your house first. And as you bless me so I can be a blessing, as you give to me so I can point your house, will you also in that same way give to me so I can build my own house? And what you'll find is that God will give you everything you need. But it is a trust thing. It is a maturity thing. I didn't always understand this, but I've had to grow and I've had to understand it. See, my son, I told you he was 18 months. He is immature. I will hear him in the kitchen letting out this yelping, crying sound like a cat in pain. I will go into the kitchen and he is reaching out towards the crunchy nut cornflakes. My son is an addict, my wife got hooked. And he will reach out towards his crunchy nut cornflakes and look to me as his loving Heavenly Father to give him what he needs to feed his addiction. Now I'm a weak father, so I will go over there and I will get out five crunchy nut cornflakes and I will give them to my son. His face lights up, he grabs me in his hand, he runs away and he hides them behind a pillow, thinking I'm not watching him. Then he comes back and has the audacity to ask me for some more. Why does my son hide his treasure? Why does my son store away his food? Because he has not understood who I am. He has not understood that I'm his father and I'm his provider. What my son will truly understand as he matures is that I am an unlimited source of crunch nut conflicts. He just doesn't understand that. It's a maturity thing. And maybe there's some of us in the room, the reason we hold our treasure so tight it's because we have not fully understand that our God is an unlimited source of provision. He is our Father, He is our provider, and He will give us everything we need. Everything we need. But I've got to be honest with you, because there is some bad teaching when it comes to this area. He will give you everything you need, not everything you greed. He'll provide your needs and not your greeds. And see, yes, my son does want crunch out cornflakes, but I'm not going to give him crunch out cornflakes three times a day, every day. No, I'm going to give him a balanced diet. In fact, there's a whole world of cereals that I can't wait to introduce him to. Gonna give him some wheat mix, gonna give him some sugar bus, gonna give him some rice krispies and cocoa pops, gonna give him some golden grain, gonna give him some Cheerios. Come on, who loves some cereal in the house today? Come on, love cereal. My son does not understand, but over the days, I'm gonna give him a balanced diet. Why? Because I love him and I know what he needs. In the same way, God knows our needs. And we're gonna make sure that if we ever do give into the house of God, we're not giving to get. We think that we give to change, God's going to give to us. He will give to you. He will give you a supply, but he's looking at your heart. And he's looking for someone who's going to trust him. And if you trust him, he'll supply your needs. See, the problem is the reason we want more finance in our life is because we want to buy things we don't need, with money we don't have, to impress people we don't even like. Did you know your heavenly father is not going to give you finance to feed your insecurities? He's not. He's going to give you finance so that you will trust him. Because what does he want? Not your money. He wants your heart. God wants to take you on a journey where you can build that relationship with him and you trust him. Now, I'm not the money man. People don't go, Dan, Brian, can you come and speak to the church about money? I'm not that guy. I've never ever gone to any church to speak about money. But I speak to my church about money because I care about you guys and I care about you understanding this. When I was 21 years old, before I was working with Hillsong, I was in £8,000 worth of debt. Then I went to a Christian festival and I saw my wife, Charlie, from across the room. I thought she looks like she's got a nice personality. So I walked over to her and introduced myself and we started dating and it was incredible. And about six months in, we started getting serious and I told her I was in £8,000 worth of debt. She goes, really? I said, yeah, really. She goes, well, you better fix that. Otherwise, if we get married, your debt's going to become my debt and I'm not having that. I was like, all right, blunt, well, fair enough. So I spent the next few months working really hard to pay off my debt. We got married and I was debt free. First thing we did is we decided to have a joint bank account. Does it say in the Bible have a joint bank account? No, it doesn't. We decided because we wanted to have a level of transparency. I wanted to make sure she wasn't buying cleaning products behind my back. I wanted to see what was happening with the area of finances. Then we decided to tie. 
we decided to bring 10% of what we earn into the house. Why? Because we'd seen how much the house had blessed us. We'd seen how people walking into the house and counting God's grace and changed their life. We, we just decided if there was anything that was actually going to make an impact on people's lives, we, we knew it was Jesus and his church, so we wanted to do that. Now, you might be here and you might be like, I don't agree with the 10% type. That's fine. That's the beautiful thing about church. You don't have to agree with it to be part of our church. You can come as much as you want and you don't have to do anything you don't want to. But we decide, me and Chai decided we wanted to do this. After being married for one year, we decided that we wanted to stretch our faith out. We wanted to step out, out of our comfort zone. So we decided that every year of being married, we're going to just up in another percentage. May 2020, we will be married 10 years. I'm already planning what I'm going to buy her for, that, for, for that celebration, for that anniversary. This is a brand new yellow Dyson. She's going to love it. <laughs> but come May 2020, we'll be married in 10 years. So that means we'll be giving 20% of our wage that comes in, goes straight out to the house of God. And you might be sitting here saying, Dan, well, surely if you do that, you must be struggling, man. But here's the thing, we're not. We've got everything we need. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not minted. I'm not boiling. Don't come and see me after the service thinking I'm going to be here until I'm like, out 50. I'm not that guy. But I've got a roof over my head. I've got food on the table. I can provide for my son. I can bless my friends. And every night I put my head on my pillow. I'm so grateful and thankful that my Heavenly Father is my provider. My confidence is not my career. My security is not my salary. It is in Him and Him alone. And I'm not saying you need to do what I do. But all I'm saying is this. Be like Nehemiah. Step out of your comfort zone and just trust God. Because the whole world will say, spend your whole life putting a trust fund. I'm all about savings, but I'm all about trusting God with your funds. And you watch how he will give you everything you need to succeed in what he's called you to do. Nehemiah has the vision. Now he's got the provision. But if he is truly going to go on mission, if he is truly going to rebuild the walls, he has to have some people around him. So he gathers them together, the leaders and the nobles. And this is what it says in Nehemiah 2 verse 17. But now I said to them, you know very well what trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. They replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. This is such an incredible picture here. He stepped in from the outside. Now he's on the inside. He's gathered everyone together. And he's like, you know this wall that's been down for over 100 years? Yeah. It doesn't need to be this way. Together we can rebuild the walls. There would be youth there, there would be teenagers there, there would be YX, YA there, and they would not have ever known that the wall was up. All they've ever known is the wall being torn down. But Nehemiah said it doesn't need to be this way. Statement number three, it's always going to be like this. It's always going to be this way. But the truth is, together we can change the narrative. Together we can change the narrative. Nehemiah was there to change the narrative. To tell them that they can need to see different and together something significant can happen. And I believe the reason we are here in Birmingham is to be exactly the same. To go into this city and to tell people, no matter what the doubt and negativity is, no matter what the TV screens and the magazines say, we say, actually, it doesn't need to be this way. Together, we can change the narrative. We are meant to be the voice of hope and the anthem of triumph. And I wonder if you actually see yourself as nearby. Because I believe God is saying today, Nehemiah is here and here and here and here. And maybe you've not and maybe you've never looked at your sphere of influence. Maybe you've never looked at your friendship group and your family as you've been positioned in such a place for such a time as this. For you to speak into that situation. But when you hear the doubt and the negativity of people giving up, that's when you say, no, no, and together we can change the narrative. You know, just this week I was watching the news. Apparently rape has gone up 40% in the UK in the last year. Well, maybe it's always going to be that way. Maybe together we can change the narrative. I don't believe the answer is just giving out way more pepper spray to girls on the night out. I believe one of the answers is get behind our schools project, which is going into schools across the UK, educating young men on how to honour women, respect women, and what healthy relationships is all about. We can't do everything, but we can definitely do something. When it comes to hopelessness in the last five years, the amount of people dying on the streets in the UK has more than doubled. But maybe it's just always going to be that way. Or maybe together we can change the narrative. Maybe we can get behind Green Light, which is our medical van, which goes to different cities in the UK and gives medicine to the homeless people who are struggling and dying on the streets. We can't do everything, but we definitely can do something. What about mental health? By the year 2020, one in four Britons will experience some form of mental health. Maybe we say, well, it's an epidemic. It's always going to be that way. 
Well, maybe together we can change the narrative. Maybe we can believe Romans 12, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but allow God to transform us by the renewing of your mind. If there's anyone who's meant to be leading the way and overcoming mental health, surely it's the body of Christ. Surely it's his house, because he, we know that he can do all things. That right now, I just want everyone just to close your eyes right now. Heavenly Father, if there was anyone here struggling with any form of mental health, whether it's severe anxiety, depression, sleepless nights, worry and fear, Lord, I pray right now that you'll start to heal them. I pray right now that you'll start to restore them. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray that you will do what only you can do right now. And I pray that you'll start to bring restoration by giving joy and excitement and passion and hope. Father, I pray that every single mind, Father God, that those, those thoughts will become your thoughts, become God conscious. I pray for courage and boldness and confidence. Father, I pray for anyone in this room struggling with any form of mental health, that when they go back into their sphere of influence today, when they go back into work or their school or the university tomorrow, that there'll be a significant difference and they'll know that you've started a great work in them and through them. In your mighty name, amen. amen. If you were one of those people that I was just praying for, the thing is, when it comes to mental health, sometimes we're very ashamed. We're not ashamed of physical health, only mental health. If I break my arm, I'm more than happy to tell you I'm going to the doctors to get fixed. Why? We're okay with physical health, but for some reason we're very embarrassed about mental health. You know what? The world might be embarrassed about mental health, but in our house we're not embarrassed about mental health. And if you are going through anything today, you need to understand that this is a community, not a corporation, and it is a family, not a firm. And if you haven't told anyone in this house that you're actually going through some stuff, I want to encourage you today to have the boldness and the confidence just to share with one person so that they can walk out that journey with you. Because like I said, we're not just doing church today, we're not just attending the service, but we're believing for lives to be changed and transformed. He's got everyone together. They're all starting the great work and it'd be amazing if it finished here and they established the wall, but it didn't. You read through chapter three, you see there's the perfumers, there's the goldsmiths, there's the priests, everyone from different backgrounds, they're all playing different parts. They're laying bricks and they're rebuilding gates. Apart from chapter three, verses five. I almost missed it. It said, the leaders of Tekoa would not contribute. In some translations it says, the leaders of Tekoa would not participate and some it says they would not get their hands dirty. I did some research thinking, who are these leaders of Tekoa? I found out that from Jerusalem, Tekoa was 10 miles away, and it was on the edge of the wilderness. The wilderness is a place of nothingness. The wilderness is a place of wasteland. How crazy is it that here is Jerusalem, where the walls are being rebuilt. This is going to make a difference from generation to generation. This right here, we read in the Bible as it changed everything. We're just 10 miles away, nothingness. Now, I was wondering why they didn't contribute. Maybe they didn't feel like they had a part to play. Maybe they didn't feel like their contribution was enough. Maybe they were offended. I don't know why they didn't contribute, but this is what I do know. Forever, for whoever reads Nehemiah chapter three, they will always be known as the people who didn't contribute. You know, I was thinking when it comes to Heart for the House next Sunday, what would be some of the reasons, if I was here for my first time, that I wouldn't contribute? If I was here 10 years ago, I tell you what, I wouldn't contribute because I was in debt, because I was broke. And as great as it is that everyone's gathering together to give to the house of God, I would not have contributed 10 years ago because I would have felt that my contribution wasn't enough. Well, statement number four. Statement number four has come up here. My contribution isn't enough. False. It's the heart behind the contribution that matters. And I just, I don't want to miss anything today. I just want everyone on the same page. Some of you, like me, might be sitting here today and saying, kid down, my contribution isn't enough. I've only got a fiver. It's not about your contribution. It's about the heart behind the contribution that matters. Hill Song South Africa were doing their heart for the house. And there were two songs deep in worship, and there was a youth leader there saving a seat for one of his youth. He didn't know where he was, so he went outside the front to look for him. There, the young person turned up, soaking wet. He said to the young person, he said, why are you late and why are you wet? The young person said, well, my mom gave me my bus money, and I came out of my house. And then I remembered that it's half of the house Sunday. So I decided not to get the bus. I decided to run through the rain, knowing that yes, it would be late, but at least I'd be able to contribute to half a house. I tell you, that young teenager, he totally understood what half a house is all about. It is not about the size of the contribution, it's about the heart behind the 
your contribution, contribution. And the reason I'm saying this is because if you have five pounds to bring next Sunday, next Sunday or you have five thousand pounds to bring, or you even have five million pounds to bring, God is not looking at what you're putting in the container. He's looking at the heart. So I'm speaking to the people who are only bringing five pounds next Sunday. I want you guys to bring your five pounds and bring it confidently and boldly with so much excitement and passion as if you're bringing five million in. Don't for one moment think that your contribution is not enough or your contribution is not significant. That what you're bringing is laying a brick and if everyone just keeps bringing brick by brick by brick, we're going to be rebuilding the walls, we're going to be building his house so that from generation to generation, people have a place that they can call home so people get to see that God is not a distant God, he's not a dead God, he is alive. And you can say, I played my part in what God did. I truly believe that one day in the history books it will be written what God did through our church and other many great churches in the UK. But what God is doing in the UK through Hillsong Church, I believe will one day be written about in the history books. And the great thing about it is not about the name of Hillsong. It's not about the name of Brian and Bobby. It's not about the name of Gary, Gary Cathy. It's about one name and one name only. The name of Jesus Christ. As the worship team come and join me up here, we'll read this final scripture. It says this in Nehemiah 6, verse 6. There is a rumor among the surrounding nations, and Geshem tells me it is true, that you and the Jews are planning to rebel, and that's why you are building the wall. According to his reports, you plan to be their king. He also reports that you have appointed prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim about you. Look, there is a king in Judah. You can be very sure that this report will get back to the king. So I suggest that you come and talk it over with me. I replied, there is no truth in any part of your story. If you are making up, um, you are making up the whole thing. They were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us to stop the work. So I continued the work with even greater determination. The final statement, if it is God's will, there will be no opposition. False. If it's God's will, there will be opposition. There's, there's no point me saying that it's going to be easy. It's not. In fact, the last 20 years of seeing Hillsong UK established, you ask Gary and Kathy, it has been hard work. It has been celebration, and then it's been hard. And then it's been celebration, and then it's been hard work. It's been celebration, and then it's been hard work. And I believe God is trying to build a strong, resilient church who is ready to withstand any opposition that comes our way. So I'm saying, do not fear it, but do expect it. What were people doing? They were saying rumors, saying rumors about Nehemiah. They were saying that he was trying to build his own kingdom. But he says, they're trying to intimidate us. They're trying to discourage us. I'm going to continue the work with great determination. Just go on the internet. You will see people saying stuff about our God. People trying to say stuff about our Savior, Jesus Christ. Just go onto the internet. You will see people saying stuff about our church. And if you don't have your own conviction, if you don't build on your own foundation of Jesus, then you'll be swayed from side to side. But I want to encourage you today to have a firm conviction in why you build your house on why you build his why you build your house on the firm, firm foundation of Jesus Christ. He is your rock, he is your sword, he is your cornerstone, he is your everything. We know Nehemiah's motivation. His motivation was because his heart broke for the people. So when they said he was trying to build his own kingdom, we know because we read it that his heart was in the right place. You need to know what our heart for, heart, our heart is all about. And I've already said it, but our heart is not to build the name of Hillsong. Our heart is to build the name of Jesus Christ. And so if you too resonate with that, you're about his name and his name only, I want to encourage you, no matter what comes against us, to not be intimidated or discouraged, but just continue to work with great determination. This is a great season for us. The next 20 years of Hillsong London, I believe God is going to do something so significant, but we are all invited to be part of it. God is calling us all to rise up to the challenge as we go forth and do what God has called us to do. And the moment Jesus isn't at the forefront, I'm out. And the moment Jesus is no longer at the forefront, we should all leave. But if we know he is always right in the middle of this very church, he is always the head, always the king, I want to encourage you with all of my heart to step into everything that he has for us. As we put the final scripture up here, this is exactly what happened. It says this, on October 2nd, the war was finished, just 52 days after we had begun. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. This is why we do what we do. Because when we do what we do, God does what only He can do, that people can get to see that He is alive and God gets the glory. 
Is there anyone in this room who wants to see God get the glory for everything we do? Because it's biblical, all the way through the Bible. Exodus 40, verse 17, God says, I will take you through the Red Sea, and I will see glory. 1 Samuel 12 says, I will rescue a people for my name's sake. Psalm 115 says, not to me, O Lord, not to mine be the glory, but to your name be the glory for your kindness and your truth. Isaiah 43 says, even when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, for I love you. Do not be afraid, for I created you for my glory. Matthew 5, verse 16 says, show your good deeds, not for your glory, but for God's glory, so people will praise your heavenly Father. Romans 9 says, you have been appointed to display his power within you, so that his name will spread throughout all the earth. And Revelation 4 says, worthy you, Lord, to receive all glory, honor, and power, for you created all things. Church, I've come all this way from London to Birmingham, which is only two hours, so it's not that long. But I've traveled these two hours to tell you this, that God is not done. He's just getting started. And as we all step up and step in, He will give us everything we need to do what He's called us to do. And what's going to happen? He is going to give the praise. He is going to give the glory. And the name of Jesus Christ will be lifted high. So come on, while we stand to our feet, let's pray and let's worship. Why don't we just for the next 30 seconds to a minute, why don't we just start to pray for Birmingham? I don't know what part of Birmingham you live in. I don't know if you live in the middle. I don't know if you live in the outskirts. I don't know if you're a teacher or a politician. I don't know if you're a parent. I don't know if you're a son or a daughter. I don't know what your job is, what your career is, who your friendship circles are. I do not know nothing about you, but I do know this. Birmingham does not need a new definition of Christianity. It needs a new demonstration of Christianity. And now is the time. God has called you for a reason. So if you're comfortable, why don't you just lift your hands to God right now. Heavenly Father, I pray for every single person here. And I pray that you fill them with courage and boldness. And we start to pray for Birmingham. We start to pray for the city. We know that we are here for a reason. It's not just to have something to attend on a Sunday. No, it's to see lives change and transform. Father, we pray for revival in this city. We pray for people who are poor in spirit to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray for people who are sick with diseases and illness to be set free. For by your stripes we are healed. We pray for people who have lost hope, people who are struggling, people with suicidal thoughts. We pray that they'll get to experience the light. Father, we pray that love you will experience something that has never been seen before, that has never been done before. And Lord, I pray that we will not get the praise. I pray that we will not get the glory. But your name, Jesus Christ, you will get the glory. Because you are the King of Kings. Because you are the Lord of Lords. You are the first and last. You are the beginning and the end. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the architect of the universe and the manager of all times. Who always was, who always is, who always will be. I'm moved, I'm changed, I'm defeated. And what you did on this cross can never be undone. So today we give you the praise.
you all come and worship the Lord. Romans 10 verse 9, it says, If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, then you will be saved. I'm aware there might be some people in the room today 